What's up everyone, my name is Chance, I'm with Real Sim Gear. In this video, we're gonna do a deep dive into the POH or the Pilot's Operating Handbook. And this video is actually a sneak peek inside of our brand new online course called Flight Sim Pro, which is designed to accelerate your flight training towards the private pilot certificate using an at-home flight simulator. And I had designed it in a way as if I was grooming one of my own student pilots, since I'm a flight instructor with over 3000 flight hours, as if I was grooming one of my own student pilots before they started their flight training, to be able to essentially breeze through their private pilot certificate. And that way you could show up on your first day and already know all of the procedures of how to start, taxi, take off, level off, cruise, descend, land, shut down, right? All of the things. And I also designed it while trying to keep in mind what would be the perfect homework to assign a student before XYZ lesson. Because as a flight instructor, the better I am at assigning homework, the easier my job is. And more importantly, the less frustrated the student will be throughout their entire training, since they'll just be better, more knowledgeable pilots because of it. And there's a billion YouTube videos out there and they may not all have the right detail that I want the student to learn or you got to spend hours filtering for the good ones, which those little details are a big reason for a lot of videos in the course, like this one especially. So this video is what I tell all of my students. And the reason I'm sharing with you right now is so that you can begin to learn how to look things up for yourself. So you can begin to learn where the information really comes from without having to rely on the words of other people, myself included, but instead rely on the published facts in order to be a knowledgeable, safe, and self-sufficient pilot. So anyway, there's a link below if you want to check out another sneak peek inside the course called How to Start a Cessna 172. Also, there are chapters in the video if you hover your mouse over the uh, squirrely bar thing in case you want to refer to a specific section in the POH later. And it would mean the world to me if you would hit that subscribe button so you can catch our future videos. Enjoy. <laughs> In this video, I wanna to talk to you specifically about the POH, which stands for Pilots Operating Handbook. I'm also gonna be highlighting some of my favorite bits of information inside of each section of the POH, so that way you have an idea of what all you can find in this book. I think it's extremely important for you to know what information that you can find inside of the POH because it's important to know where any aviation-related information comes from. So when someone asks you why you do something a certain way, you don't fall into the common general aviation pitfall of saying, oh, because I saw it on YouTube, or because my instructor told me so, or because that's the way Chance does it in Flight Sim Pro but rather it says so in the POH in section four, or that's what it says in the regulation 91205. Especially when you're learning to do things for the first time, you wanna learn how to do things by the book. And well, this is the book. You can find an entire chapter dedicated to flight manuals and documents in chapter nine of the P-Hack, where it specifically describes the POH and all of its sections in further detail. But I'm gonna do my best for you to sum it up in this video. The POH not only has descriptions of all the systems, V speeds, and the limitations of the aircraft, but it's also where all of the little plastic checklists come from. Third-party checklists must at least satisfy everything that's in the POH in order to be used for that aircraft. Don't quote me on this because it's probably an old aviation wives tale to scare student pilots, but I heard a story of a student pilot on a check ride who made his own checklist. He reordered some things, took some things out he never did, and color coded it to look nice. And on the day of his check ride, the examiner asked him a simple question. Can you use that checklist and why? Well, what do you think? Yes or no? Well, the student pilot in this story couldn't tell the examiner yes or no confidently and even why it might be okay. And he failed his check ride before ever getting to start the airplane. Plane. The correct answer would have been, yes, I can use it, so long as I ensure that it satisfies everything in the POH's checklist in section three and four of the POH. Actually, the FAA would probably word it as, no, you can't, unless it satisfies the POH. You'll notice that kind of thing as you read the regulations. Now, in order for an airplane to be airworthy, it must satisfy many things, one of which is that the plane must have a POH on board. And it's important to know that every airplane will have its own POH inside of the aircraft that is specific to that airplane's serial number. So I couldn't take one POH out of a 1983 Cessna 172 and use it for another 1983 Cessna 172 to satisfy airworthiness. So while a dummy POH like this that you can buy from the pilot shop is okay to use for basic information like speeds, performance, and procedures, it can't be used to satisfy airworthiness per the regs. And you should ultimately reference the real POH to determine airworthiness, performance, weight and balance, etc. That being said, if I wanted to purchase one of these to study and there was an inexpensive 1979 Cessna 172 POH, but I was flying a 1983, I would still buy it for study purposes as there's not going to be that many differences. Now, I do highly recommend purchasing a physical copy of one of these. That way you can tab out and highlight throughout as you'll need to reference this a lot during your flight training and even during flight lessons. You're going to want to read this cover to cover more than once. I'll provide a link below for many general aviation training aircraft if you want to pick one up for yourself, as well as I found some free digital copies that I'll link down below for you. Now, the nice thing is, is that in the 70s, the pilot's operating handbooks were standardized so that every section is the same from airplane to airplane. So whether you're flying a Cessna 172, a 182, a 
Piper Warrior, Archer, or an Arrow, every section will go in the same order for every airplane. Section 7 will always be systems, and Section 3 will always be emergency procedures, which is obviously good to be able to quickly reference. Now, if a plane was manufactured before 1975, then the sections may vary, but it will still contain the same information. So anyway, let me give you a brief description of each of the sections of the POH so you can confidently go through this on your own. Okay, so as we open up the POH, we're going to get to this first page right here that is basically saying that we cannot use this dummy POH as a substitute for the official pilot's operating handbook and FAA approved airplane flight manual intended for the operation of the airplane or the airworthiness. So we already know that we're just using this for study purposes. And so per the regs, you need to have on board the airplane an FAA approved airplane flight manual and a pilot's operating handbook. But a lot of times a POH will have the information in it to constitute an airplane flight manual. And so we don't need to have a second book inside of the cockpit. But if it doesn't say that up here, then you got to make sure that it does have an airplane flight manual on board. Then down here, you're going to see where the serial number would go if it was tied to a specific airplane and then the registration number. And then down here, it says this handbook does constitute the FAA approved airplane flight manual. Okay, moving right along. This page just says, congratulations, Cessna owner. Most of you are probably not Cessna owners. And then on to this page. So this page is going to give you nice kind of at a glance information about the airplane. Things like your service ceiling. Good luck getting to 14,200 in a Cessna 172 with 160 horsepower. And you're also going to see your takeoff performance, ground roll, if you need to clear a 50 foot obstacle. Keep in mind that any performance values inside of the POH are based off of a brand new airplane right off the flight line in 1979 in this case. And so you always want to take any of these numbers with a grain of salt. That being said, when you're doing your flight planning, I always recommend calculating to the exact numbers and then adding in a buffer for things like the what if factor and older performance of an aircraft. So some good stuff on this page, moving right along. Then we get to the table of contents. With anything in aviation, you always want to start with the table of contents. So you'll see here that there are several sections. And so let's briefly go over each one. So first we have section one, general. This is general information about the airplane. Things like your engine model number, your fuel capacity, oil type, all that stuff. And you can quickly look at the table of contents to see what kind of things you can find in that section. Now, I get asked a lot, why do I need to know what the model number is for the engine? Well, I flew for a skydive place here in San Diego for about a year and a half. And one time I ran into another pilot from another drop zone. I asked him what type of plane he was flying. And he said, I'm flying a twin otter. I said, that's awesome. I've never flown one of those before. What kind of engines are in that thing? And he responded with, well, I don't actually know what the engine model number is, but I know it's got blank horsepower and it's fuel injected, et cetera. And honestly, I was shocked that he didn't know what model of engine he had. You need to know your systems because things like your engine model number may not seem like useful information, but can actually tell you a lot about the airplane. So let me show you where you can find it and I'll explain why. General, table of contents, under engine. So that says to go to page one tack three. So we'll just flip over one page and we'll find the descriptive data, engine. And it says the manufacturer of the engine is Lycoming and the engine model number is an 0320 H2 AD. So what the heck does that mean? Let's keep reading and I'll explain. It goes on to describe the engine characteristics here. So it says the engine type, normally aspirated, direct drive, air-cooled, horizontally opposed, carbureted equipped, four-cylinder engine with 320 cubic inches of displacement. So that may seem like a ton of information, but if you memorize the engine model number and this helpful acronym LHAND, that will definitely help you remember it all. LHAND is out of the scope of this video, but take a screenshot of this or write it down and ask your instructor about it later. Okay, it also says right here the horsepower rating and the engine speed. So it's 160 horsepower at 2700 RPM. So at that RPM, you're going to get the 160 horsepower. And if you don't know what any of that means, I'll link some videos down below or run it by your instructor, like I said. But how does the engine model number tell me anywhere close to that information? Well, let's break it down. The O stands for opposed or horizontally opposed cylinders. Think like a boxer engine. If this engine was fuel injected, it would say IO. So the I would stand for injected. So the absence of an I here means that this engine has a carburetor. And if it had a turbo and was fuel injected, it would say TIO. Make sense? Now the 320 refers to 320 cubic inches of displacement, which means the volume of displacement inside of all of the cylinders combined. And it's a great indication of how much horsepower it has. This doesn't work for every airplane, but a lot of the time, if you have the cubic displacement, you get the horsepower. So an 0320 Cessna generally has a 160 horsepower and an 0360 generally has a 180 horsepower. However, it's not a hard and fast rule. Just like I was flying a Cessna 206 when I was flying skydive, which had an IO 540 and that had 265 horsepower. So not a perfect solution, but it helps to understand a little bit more about the airplane, if nothing else. Now, the rest of the numbers here, you don't really have to worry about all too much the H2AD. The letters that follow the cubic inches do tell you more about the engine, but there are so many exceptions and one-off engines out there that you don't terribly need to know at the private pilot level or even commercial pilot level. But if you're interested, ask your local maintenance personnel or check the link that I provided below. Okay, I'm done ranting about the model number back to the POH. So I'll just thumb through the rest of this section with you to kind of see what we can find. So it's going to tell you about the propeller, the minimum and maximum diameter of the propeller, what type of fuel you can use inside of the engine, talks about the standard and 
long range tanks. Notice that there's a difference between total capacity of fuel and usable fuel. So we can't use a few gallons or one and a half gallons per tank for this airplane. Different types of oil you can use, the oil capacity. Then it talks a little bit about weight and balance here. And here it says maximum useful load for the different categories. These numbers are actually going to be superseded by the most recent weight and balance check that's been done on the airplane. You're going to find that probably in a separate folder inside of the aircraft, but these can give you kind of a rough estimate of what they might be. Ultimately though, you need to reference that weight and balance data sheet. And real quick, the difference between the normal and the utility category is that you can do limited aerobatics such as spins. In the normal category, you can't. Moving right along, this is a nice page when you're just starting out as that gives you a bunch of definitions for the different indicated air speeds, the different V speeds, some weather terms, engine power terms, performance terms, things like that, weight and balance terminology. So that kind of ends that section with a bunch of definitions. And then we get to section two, limitations. This is where you can find a handful of your V speeds, which can change from airplane to airplane. So this is a great place to reference before flying a new plane. And by the way, V speeds are the various indicated air speeds that are used to achieve a certain performance out of the airplane or set a limitation, such as best rate of climb, best glide, stall speeds, and the never exceed speed. You can also find the load limits of the airplane. So how many positive or negative Gs that you can pull before potentially breaking or causing structural damage. And so let's flip through this thing and kind of do the same thing here. This is where you're going to find your V speeds and tells you what it is. Notice maneuvering speed has some different weight limits with it. Describes what the white arc is used for, the green arc, the yellow arc, the red line. Talks about some more limitations of the, the engine. So 2700 RPM is going to be your red line. It's a limit, limitation on the engine, right? Talks about your center of gravity limits, maneuvering limits. Right here it says aerobatics maneuvers, including spins, are not approved in the normal category, right? We just talked about that. Load limit factors, positive, negative Gs you're allowed to pull, fuel limitations, uh, when to move the fuel selector valve in the left or right position when you're parked on a sloped surface. That's a good one. And then finally, we get to this last part of section two where it talks about the placard. So all of these placards are required to be somewhere in the plane for it to be airworthy and they should be checked prior to flight. For some reason, these don't ever get checked until the day before a check ride, but I encourage you to ask your instructor to show you where all of the placards are, or if you want to check for yourself, it'll tell you right above each placard where they're located. Okay, moving on to section three, which is emergency procedures. Obviously, this one is incredibly important to go through. Most of the time, these plastic checklists won't contain every emergency, so it's imperative to basically memorize this part of the POH. Now, even though I am a strong advocate of memorizing even the tiniest details when it comes to aviation, it's perfectly acceptable even on your check ride to look things up if you don't know the answer. Even airline pilots, when they experience something like an engine failure, they will break out the POH and read it together with their co-pilot to troubleshoot verbatim what it says to do in the checklist. And that's okay for you to do as well while you're flying. If I had an alternator failure or my landing gear wouldn't lock down, then the very first thing that I would do would be to grab the airplane's POH and go through exactly what it says to do in there. That's not to say that there isn't a time and place for doing memory items or flows, but you just kind of learn which method is good for which scenarios. So let's thumb through the section and see what good stuff that we can find. So after the table of contents, after the introduction, it talks about the air speeds for emergency operation. And so if you had an engine failure, if you needed a pitch for your best glide, that's going to give you your speed for that. If you're landing without power, flaps up, flaps down, those are your speeds. And then it goes on to the operational checklist. And so these are just kind of what to do if you encounter any of these emergencies. So things like an engine failure during takeoff, an engine failure after takeoff, during flight, forced landings without power, with engine power, ditching. It goes so far as to say if you're landing in water, kind of what to do. And if there's high winds and heavy seas, land into the wind. And if it's light winds and heavy swells, land parallel the swells. That's a really good one to know too. And then what if you encounter a fire, for example, during starting on the ground? The answer might surprise you. You continue crank the engine. You keep trying to start the engine to suck in the flame. And that's what it describes to do right there. Engine fire in flight, electrical fire in flight. Obviously, if I had a fire and I was flying through the air, I wouldn't want to be scrambling for the POH to read off what it does. I would want to have memorized what it says right here. And then once I put the fire out, if I want to keep it out, I will then grab my POH and make sure that I've done everything correctly. Okay, moving on. So cabin fire, wing fire, icing, what to do in icing. Again, that's a really, really good one to memorize. Hopefully you don't ever put yourself in some unintentional icing condition, but uh, you want to read what it says to do there. Landing with a flat tire, that's a great one. Low voltage light, if that illuminates, if you have too much voltage or not enough voltage, it's going to tell you what to do in these. And then at the end of section three, you're going to get amplified procedures. Basically, it's going to go over all of those checklist items of what to do in those emergencies. And it's just going to expand textually on that information. So like, what if you encounter an engine failure? It's just going to describe thoroughly what to do. You're also going to see this graph right here, which shows you your glide distance or your glide ratio. And so for every 6,000 feet up, which is about a nautical mile, I can glide for it if I follow this line down about nine nautical miles. And so I have a nine to one glide ratio in the Cessna 172. It's good to know that. And you can actually program that nine to one ratio into for flight so that when you're flying around, that light blue line that kind of follows you around is shown 
showing you what you could glide to from your altitude at that 91 ratio. So it's just going to expand on forced landings, landings without elevator control. That's a good one to read. What happens if you go VFR into IMC? If you're descending through the clouds, if you have some icing conditions like a static source blocked, so if you inadvertently get into a spin, might want to read that before you're spinning. Spark plugs fouling. I can't tell you how many times I've watched people taxi back because they couldn't fix the fouled up spark plugs in their engine. I'll show you how to fix that later in the run-up video on the course, but if they read through this, maybe they would have been able to fix it. Magneto malfunction, oil pressure, all this good stuff. So just make sure you read through this whole section, guys. Super, super important. We're just going to move right along to now section four, which is normal procedures. This is the section that I talked about earlier as it's where all of the checklists come from. From pre-flight to shutdown, it has it all. Now, it's not going to be the most thorough, and for some reason, some Piper aircraft have more detail here, but this is the foundation that you need to have in order to properly adapt to real life situations. Like for those of you that have done a pre-flight in a Cessna, what if I asked you why you start the pre-flight from inside the cockpit, drop your flaps, check the lights, and then go counterclockwise around the airplane? Ask yourself, is the answer to that question? Because that's how my instructor taught me. We'll check it out. If we flip just a couple pages into section four normal procedures, we're going to see this graph right here. And this is how the manufacturer wants us to pre-flight the aircraft. Start inside the cockpit, check a couple things, and then work our way around checking all these different things counterclockwise around the plane. Now, like I said, it's not the most thorough as we do do a couple extra things after we turn on the master switch. Besides checking the fuel indicators, we check our lights, we put the flaps down, right? And then we turn the master switch off. But as I said, this is the foundation that you should at least know exists. I can't tell you how many 40 hour student pilots that I've gotten from other instructors that didn't know this page even existed. Another good one is here in the takeoff section when it talks about short field takeoffs. I've seen people fail their check rides because they use 10 degrees of flaps for a short field takeoff. And the examiner then asked them why they use 10 degrees of flaps for that takeoff. And they probably responded with because my instructor told me to use flaps because it reduces the takeoff roll. Well, let's see what it says here in the POH. In section four, under takeoff, short field takeoff, and it says wing flaps up. The point is, is that it varies from plane to plane. So always do your own due diligence and see what it says inside the POH. Heck, even on my commercial check ride, the examiner tried to catch me by saying I didn't use 10 degrees of flaps for my short field takeoff. And he made me prove it to him by showing him the POH says to not use flaps. You'll impress your examiner if you're able to cite these things. So please read through this section. I would recommend going through the section with your checklist, with your flight school's checklist or whatever you have, and making sure that things line up. And if they don't, ask your instructor about it. All right, after the checklist portion of normal procedure section four, we're going to get to another amplified procedure section that basically just does a deep dive into everything that the checklist says. So starting the engine, taxiing, why we use different aileron positions when we're taxiing. I'm going to explain this a little more later in the course in the how to taxi video, but this kind of explains it right here too. And um, what to do in the before takeoff checklist, your magneto check, kind of why you do it. And so the point is you can figure out a ton of things about the airplane from this section. And so if I'm explaining things throughout the course and you want some more information about it, or you wonder why I'm doing something, come to the POH in this section and read about it. So it's just going to expand on everything. So like your wing flap settings, like why we want to use 10 degrees of flaps for soft fields and not short fields, what to do in a crosswind takeoff and why your climb cruise, those kinds of things. Okay. Stalls. It talks about leaning to the best economy setting while in cruise and how you want that to be your peak exhaust gas temperature. I talk about this in the eight tips for cruise video coming up, but, but it kind of explains that a little bit here too. Talks about spins, how to recover from a spin, why it works, landing, cold operation, hot operation. So make sure you read through that section. Okay, next is section five performance. This is a little later in your student pilot training, but this is where we calculate things like the runway required for takeoff and landing, fuel economy based on the weather conditions, and so on. The charts for Cessnas in the performance section are definitely a little bit easier to follow than Piper charts, but you should know how to read both. I recommend that you schedule a ground lesson with your instructor when it's time to plan a flight to go over these, and you're definitely going to see both Piper and Cessna charts on the knowledge test required for your private pilot certificate. I don't want to spend too much time here because it would just be doing an injustice. It's a little complicated. Maybe show you one example on a chart. This is where you find your airspeed calibration, by the way. This is a good thing to know because you need to know how we go from indicated airspeed to calibrated airspeed to true airspeed to equivalent airspeed. So you need to know what the difference is between all those different types of airspeeds. Okay. Gives you a temperature conversion chart here, shows you the different stall speeds at a rear center gravity or forward center gravity. So you can kind of gauge the difference between those two. It shows you takeoff and landing distances charts. You got the takeoffs in the front and then you'll have the landings in the back. The time, fuel, and distance to climb. This is a good one here. So let's take a quick look. You're always going to see some conditions up here, some notes. And so make sure you read through these. Like if it's too hot, you need to add 10%. You need to do the proper stuff, like leaning the mixture above 3000 feet in order to achieve that maximum RPM, right? And then this is based off of max gross weight. So the 2,300 pounds for all of these values. So if you're a little lighter, you don't have as much fuel or people on board, then you're probably going to get better numbers than what it says here. You should plan for the worst is kind of what it's telling you to do. But basically if I was in an airport where the elevation was about a thousand feet, this is based off 
pressure altitude, a little different, but we can just kind of rough estimate. But I was at 1,000 feet elevation, so 1,000 feet MSL, and I was climbing up to 5,000 feet MSL, and I wanted to see how long that was going to take me, how much fuel I'll burn, how much lateral distance I'll cover, meaning when I'll get to my top of climb, I can use this chart to figure that stuff out. So it tells me what speed I should fly based off the altitude, it tells me my rate of climb that I'll achieve, and then so I can take the difference between this 1,000 and 5,000 to get my numbers as I climb up to 5,000 feet from 1,000. Essentially, it would take me about seven minutes. I would burn roughly 1.3 gallons, and I'll cover about eight nautical miles to get to that top of climb. Like I said in the beginning, all of these numbers are based off of a brand new airplane, brand new 1979 Cessna 172, fresh off the line. So calculate these numbers to a T so you can show it to your examiner that you know how to calculate it, but then you're definitely going to want to add in a buffer after that. You don't want to definitely need this feet per minute climb in order to clear obstacles or something. You want to make sure that there's a buffer there. Okay, moving on. Cruise performance. How many gallons per hour are you going to burn? How far are you going to go? You'll see that you'll go faster at full throttle, but you'll cover less distance. You'll go slower at a lower amount of power or lower RPM, but you'll be able to have an increased range. So you won't have to stop as much for fuel if you go slower. Rental rate versus non-rental rate. Some of you know what that means. Range profile, endurance profile, moving right along. These are your landing distances, like I said. And then we get to section six, which is weight and balance. Calculating weight and balance is a part of every single flight. So you're going to get good at it. Apps like for flight make it much more simple, but you'll still need to know how to calculate it on paper as well as it improves your overall understanding of the concepts. You also don't want to be solely reliant on apps like ForeFlight for something this important. There are some great examples in this section, but I'll link some holistic weight and balance explainer videos down below so you can check that out. Right after the example, if you want to try some of those out, these are graphs that you can use to figure out your moment arm, which is going to help you calculate your center of gravity. And then once you know your center of gravity at a specific weight, you can then put a dot where you have full fuel and where your center of gravity is. And then you want to put a dot where you have zero fuel. So you got to calculate center of gravity twice. And then you want to draw a line between the two to make sure that you stay within the envelope the entire time. And then that way you can know if you're in the normal category or the utility category. So if you wanted to do spins, like for flight instructor training, you have to do spins. You need to be in the utility category and you need to be able to calculate whether or not you're going to be in that category. Okay, moving right along, we then get to the equipment list section of the weight and balance section, which is just basically a list of all the installed or optional or required equipment on the airplane. So if you see right here, if it has the suffix R, that means it's required for FAA certification. If it has an S, it's standard equipment items. If it has an O, it's optional equipment replacing required or standard equipment. And if it has an A, it's optional equipment in addition to required or standard equipment. Basically, if it has an R in here, it is required for airworthiness. And so there's a pretty common regulation 91205, which if you haven't heard of before, is just a required equipment regulation. And we use the acronyms A Tomato Flames and Flaps to remember what we need in the daytime and the nighttime. But I like to ask my students the question, well, what if we came out to the airplane and the nose cone was missing or the spinner was missing, which is just the metal dome that's in front of the propeller? Could we still go fly? Well, it's not part of the A Tomato Flames or Flaps acronyms per 91205. And so that means we should be able to go fly, right? Well, we also have to make sure that we are compliant with the equipment list of the airplane. And so if we look here, generally on just the first page where it says power plant and accessories, we're going to see right here, spinner installation, propeller, the spinner dome, and it has an R next to it, meaning that it's a required piece of equipment that needs to be on that airplane for it to be airworthy. So just another one of those good ones. Okay, the weight and balance section ends with the equipment list, and then we come to section seven, which is airplane systems and descriptions. Imagine for a moment having a doctor giving your heart a checkup that couldn't tell you how many arteries the heart has. That's a lot like a pilot flying a plane that can't describe the systems of how that airplane works. I mean, I wish I could say that the system section is the most important section. I can't because they're all important, but this is the most important section. Knowing the systems literally saves lives. There are so many hidden gems in the system section of the POH, so please, please read this more than once, tab out and highlight throughout, and ask your instructor to elaborate on certain things that you might be confused about. Also, don't shy away from reading other articles and chapters about the various systems as you really want to be a guru in this section. My instructor told me a story, and this is probably just an old aviation wives tale again, but there was a woman who was coming in for a landing and noticed some pretty severe engine roughness. She quickly diagnosed that it was possibly carburetor icing, and with the carburetor heat already on and desperate for more power for the landing, she started pumping the engine primer because she knew that causes some fuel to bypass the carburetor and injects it into the intake ports preceding the cylinders, therefore giving her enough power to limp back to the runway. The point of the story is that knowing as much as you can about the systems could make all the difference in a life or death situation. So I encourage you to learn as much as you can from as many different resources as possible about any and all of the systems. So basically every one of these paragraphs has something that you can learn from it. I highly recommend highlighting some of the good to know or vocabulary stuff like you should be able to answer what kind of flaps we have. We have single slotted flaps. Read about the landing gear system. You 
want to know things like how our brakes work. They're hydraulically actuated. Moving right along. Here's more information about the engine, the engine instruments, what an EGT gauge is, how the oil temperature is read, engine oil system. Let's see. Let's find that, uh, yeah, carburetor and priming system right here. And so if we go to this next page right here, still in the carburetor and priming section, it says right here that the primer bypasses the carburetor and injects some fuel into the intake ports of the cylinder. It says when the plunger is pulled out and injects it into the cylinder intake ports when the plunger is pushed back in. So that's just one of those things that could make all the difference like for the woman in the story. Okay. And so it talks more about the fuel system, kind of explains more about the primer here, reiterates that it says the manual primer draws fuel from the fuel strainer, injects it into the cylinder intake ports. You're never going to forget that now. Talks about the usable fuel or unusable fuel and what the difference is between each, uh, the brake system, the electrical system. Also, you're going to see a lot of diagrams in here. And what I would tell all of my students for homework is I want you to draw all of the systems, the electrical system, the fuel system, the vacuum system. I want you to draw all of them because next time when we meet, I want you to draw all of those systems from memory because you may be asked to draw some of these systems out on your check ride. And even if you don't, it's just really good to know how these systems work, what goes before what, all of the components of it, right? It's just super, super important. Okay, moving right along here. Now we're on section eight, airplane handling, service, and maintenance. Let's say you come out to the airplane and you notice a flat tire. You then go up to maintenance Joe and tell him about the flat tire. He then proceeds to just hand you a compressor and goes back to working on his current project. What do you do? How much tire pressure does that right main need? Well, it doesn't say it on the tire. You guessed it. Take a look in the POH. We need to go to the table of contents and look for the tire pressure, which is telling us under landing gear to go to page eight, tac 12. So we'll do that. We'll flip over to eight, tac 12 under landing gear. It says the nose wheel tire pressure is 31 PSI and the mains are 29 PSI. That varies from plane to plane. So make sure if you're ever putting air in a tire, you've referenced the POH that's serialized inside of the cockpit of that airplane. Okay. Knowing a lot about not just your systems, but also the maintenance side of things could make all the difference on making a go or no go decision, or even whether or not you would actually fly that day. For example, if you came out to the airplane and you noticed that the strut, the chrome part of the nose wheel was all the way compressed, most people would go, oh, but it's supposed to show, I don't know, a few inches worth, about four fingers worth. And so I can't fly that airplane. And maybe it's your only choice to fly that day. And so you'd call maintenance Joe and you say, hey, maintenance Joe, there's something wrong with the nose gear, right? Maintenance Joe is going to be like, yeah, I'll get to it, right? And so that's a totally different conversation. But if you knew your systems and you knew how that strut actually worked, you could call maintenance Joe and just say, hey, maintenance Joe, looks like I need more air instead of my oleo pneumatic strut. Could you bring over some air to pump into this thing for me? Then maybe maintenance Joe might say, well, I'm actually on my way over there. So I'll just grab a compressor and I'll see you over there in about five minutes. And obviously you want to be able to tell if that strut just needs some more air or if it's leaking oil and has a bad seal, stuff like that. So reading through not just the system section, but also the maintenance section is going to be really good for you. All right. Finally, on to the last section, section nine supplements. This section is here in case the aircraft has any optional equipment installed. Like if there was an air conditioner on board or if it was converted to a float plane or has a strobe light system. So let's take a quick look at the float plane section because I think that's going to help you understand what's in the section. And then we're also going to check out the strobe light system. So it says the float plane section is 42 pages long and the strobe light system is only a couple pages long. So we'll probably easily find the float plane section. Perfect. We'll go to the first part. And so right here it says the supplement and then for a float plane and it says section one general. Basically what it's going to do is it's just going to go over all of the exact same sections that we just went through and it's going to supersede the information in those sections. So supersede the info in general and limitations. So you're going to have different V speeds. You're going to have different uh, load factors, different placards, things like that, different emergencies, different normal procedures, right? And so it's just going to go over all the same sections again, different amplified procedures, right? Definitely different performance as a float plane. And so you're just going to want to go through this portion of the POH if you are flying a float plane. Let's move right along to the strobe light systems. And so the strobe light system is on, I would say most general aviation aircraft at this point. So let's see what's before. Yeah, there we go. And there tends to be a lot of confusion on when you want these strobe lights to be on. And so it's going to tell you right here. So we have the supplement strobe light system. Section one general just kind of talks about what the strobe light is, where it's located, how it operates, how to turn it on and off. And then the limitation section right here. So this is the good part. It says strobe lights must be turned off when taxiing in the vicinity of other airplanes or during night flight through clouds, fog or haze. And so it's saying that when you're around other people or other aircraft, you want your strobe lights off because they can be kind of blinding. And then if you're flying through a cloud, you don't want your strobe lights on or, or fog even or haze because it's going to look like lightning. I learned that the hard way from experience of keeping my strobe lights on at nighttime as a single pilot probably should have turned my strobe lights off, right? So don't be like me. You've read the section now. Now you know to turn your strobe lights off if you're in a cloud, fog or haze. And it kind of says this in this regulation 91209 aircraft lights that you need to have your anti-collision light system on, which includes your strobe lights. But you need not have them on if the pilot command deems it in the interest of safety 
to have the strobe lights off. So that's a good one when you're around the debriefing area. Okay, that is everything A to Z that I would tell my students about the POH. Keep in mind, no one expects you to memorize everything here all at once, but if you make an intentional effort to learn the POH of your airplane, I promise it will pay huge dividends and may even save your life one day. So go pick up yourself a copy of your aircraft's POH. Try to get the same year model as well, but a year or two off again is fine as most of the information will still be pretty similar. I'll include a free link below to a PDF of a Cessna and Piper POH that I found down below. But as I said, it's best to have a physical copy to highlight and tab throughout. Lastly, I think it would be awesome if you left a comment below this video of something that you learned from either this video or the POH. I would love to see just an insane amount of good information here in the comments so other people might get something out of it for years to come. But make sure you always follow the golden rule, trust but verify. Anyway, that's it for this video. I hope you found that helpful. Let us know if you did anything else and we'll catch you in the next one. See ya.